Well, good morning. Good morning. As you know, Jesus was born to save us. But you know what? Sometimes the people in charge of our government, they don't feel happy. You know, King Herod, I'm not sure how happy he was when those three individuals came knocking on his palace and said, you know, we followed a star here, and we were told a king was born. You probably didn't want to see King Herod famous, right? I have here a representation of the three gifts that the three wise men brought. Thank you, John. <coughs> I'm going to start with the lowest shelf here. Inside here is actually flakes of real gold, okay? And gold was the gift given by the king of Arabia, Melchior. He said to have been the oldest of all three of them. And the gold in this hand-blown glass bowl is real 23 karat gold. You can go ahead and shake it like you would a regular globe. So, King Melchior gave baby Jesus and his mother and father a gift of gold. Then there was frankincense. Now, I don't want you to think that this is candy, so please, don't put this in your mouth. But I do want you to... And put it gently near your nose, not too close, because we're going to pass it around to all the other noses. <laughs> okay? And then go ahead and pass it around. So this gift was given by a caspar. It was first used by the Egyptians. In ancient times, the finest myrrh came from the slopes of southern Arabia. And it says that we could break either the frankincense or the myrrh for the extra freshness. So you know on Christmas Day, how we get gifts from our loved ones? These three are actually the first gifts given to our Lord and Savior Jesus. So these were the very first gifts. So are we ready to pray? Because that gave us some other gifts. Thank you, God, for your gift to each of us, your son Jesus. Jesus is my joy. Jesus is my peace and hope. And today he gives us his love. Amen. Are we ready to go with Karen? Yes. And thank you, Jim, for helping me. <laughs> you want to go with Karen to the door? Thank you. 
this Absolutely. for the past few weeks we're at we're just Christmas. Can't control. We've been having to <laughs> No. Guests from the original Christmas come and give their viewpoints. The first week we had Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. He came and told us his. Then we followed that up with Joseph and his story and how this coming of this baby has changed all his plans, upset them. Last week we heard from the innkeeper who we have a tendency to wait, how could you put him in a state? He's the king of kings. But he gave the best of what he had. This morning we speak to another person. Or we hear from another person. One which we read the scripture this morning, and one who we also don't really care so much about. But I shall go into character. I am glad to have this opportunity to be here. I haven't addressed a group like this for years. Centuries, really. Perhaps let me introduce myself. I'm Herod. Historians call me Herod the Great, as opposed to Herod the Lesser, I guess. There were, yeah, lesser Herods, <laughs> my sons and grandsons, to name a few. But alone, I was Herod the Great. There was a time when I would have longed to have that title. I worked hard to be a great king. And you're probably wondering what I'm doing here. Feels a little odd to me too. More uncomfortable than you realize. They warned me of that, but I've been begging for opportunity like this for years. So you have to bear with me. I'm not about to leave before I've said some things to you. Where I come from is part of our sentence that we get exactly what we wanted most in our earthly lives. I wanted fame. To be remembered. To be thought great. I got what I wanted, and now I'm condemned to having my nose rubbed in it forever. They can arrange things like this, you know. Somehow, every time an historian writes Herod the Great, I feel as though he's inscribing it upon my very chest. Every time a minister reads from Matthew 2, I feel as he's shouting in my ears. Every time some snot nosed kid in a second-rate Christmas pageant wearing his dad's old bathrobe and a cardboard crown tries to look as mean as he can. I'm forced to watch that sorry, sorry scene. Just last year, I was unfortunate to watch a pageant in a Baptist church down in Memphis. Some third grader pompously announced that he was Harold the Great. <laughs> What's that make me? An old raisin? I'm forced to experience, mind you, but nothing of what I needed. That's besides the point, though. I'm here because they finally gave in, as they always do. As I said, they gave you what you want. No doubt this too will somehow hurt, but it'll be worth it. If I can just once set the record straight, just once give my side of the story. Now, I'm not going to deny that I did some pretty unpleasant stuff. Being king, even though some say being king is good, it's a rough business, especially in the situation I was in. My father was appointed procurator for rockers, I am. Judea by Julius Caesar in 47 BC, according to your calendar. And he in turn appointed me, military perfect of Galilee. It was a chance to make a name for myself. 
and I did my job with the sort of efficiency and dedication which the Romans loved. So I somehow survived that upheaval in Rome when Caesar was assassinated. I must have been like up to Anthony, the new emperor. And by 40 BC, I was declared king of the Jews by the Roman Senate. Even though I was king of the Jews, the Jews didn't think much of me because I was only partially Jewish. The Romans, on the other hand, were suspicious of me because I was partly Jewish. Tough to be position to be in, let me tell you, to survive, to have the power necessary to rule this unruly backwater of the empire, I needed to consolidate my position. I need to make sure it was within my hand. It wasn't easy. The people didn't love me, and if I couldn't have them love me, they needed to fear. If the people weren't willing to offer me their allegiance, I would take it by force. If I couldn't maintain order, the Romans would come in with their armies. And that would be far worse than what I was offering. Life presents us all with difficult choices. Now let's be honest, you know what I'm talking about. You have your own kingdoms, just as I did. Your spheres of influence, your families, your communities, your business. You have to manage somehow. You have to find a place for yourself and exert your will. Unless you want everyone else to stop all over you. And the armies of Rome are worse by far, aren't they? So you do what you have to do, even if you don't look out for, if you don't look out for yourself, no one else will. You must protect yourself. Don't kid yourself that you haven't done what I did. Oh, I know the record isn't pretty. It's true that I had my wife killed. But you had to realize that I married her for political, not romance, reasons. She was part of the Hasmonean family, my chief rivals. I was going to make allies out of my enemies, but it didn't work. She was a true Hasmonean through and through, as were her sons. They plotted against me, everyone agreed. So I had to remove the threat. I had other wives and other sons. I know it looks bad, but we, all of us, use the power at our disposal, don't we? You don't think you would ever have done such a thing? Really? Have you ever felt threatened by someone? Ever felt the knife of jealousy thrust deep into your heart? Ever wanted to get rid of a person? Oh, you wouldn't think of murder? Of course not. You're too civilized. But have you used whatever means at your disposal? A tongue that twists the truth with just a bit and definitely passes on gossip, disguised as Christian concerns. A cold shoulder that maneuvers someone out of your life and relationships. And your spouse. Haven't you ever wanted to be free? Perhaps you've already used means at your disposal. Your courts have made it all too neat and tidy. Don't tell me I'm so bad. I'm more like you, and you'll probably like and you'll probably like to admit. After all, we're all human. At least you are, and I was. No one's perfect. It's ironic that I should be remembered in history for that brief conversation with astrologers from Persia. Who would have thought anything momentous or historic was happening? <coughs> I had been engaged in some great affairs of state. Yes, I had power, and I had used it to bring great advantage. For the good of the people, to this day, there are still ruins of cities that I built, hugging the Mediterranean. And the beloved temple of the Jews 
in Jerusalem, I built it. Am I remembered for any of that? No. But for good reason. Going back to that night, my aim, a little squirrely little guy who smelled like he had bathed in the mud and had balls on his head came to me one morning and announced the arrival of some big shots from the east. Just my one. It already had been one of those days. The chief contractor on one of my building projects had inconsiderately dropped dead. How dare he? I had heard even that a group of crazy fundamentalists had locked themselves in a synagogue in Jericho and vowed to fast until the Messiah came. And then one of my many wives told me the latest court rumor about another one of my wives. I could have used a Messiah myself that very day. But rarely do we get what we want or need. So instead, I just reached for a bottle of port when my aide announced with a shower of spit falling on my latest papers from Rome that these foreign visitors had arrived and they were bearing greetings. I started to tell him where he could put their greetings when they walked into the room. After their usual diplomatic niceties, they got right to the point. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him, they said. Well, you know the story. You've heard it told many times. That Jews had hoped for a Messiah, a deliverer from their troubles, for centuries. I couldn't believe he was actually making his appearance. But I knew the desperate longings, combined with religious fanaticism, could easily produce a Messiah. And these astrologers from the East, King of the Jews, what to make of all of this? I don't know, but I had to get to the bottom of it. When my theologians told me tradition said that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, we gave the astrologers directions and told them to let us know where the child was to be found. When they slipped across the border without a briefing, I got worried. What if they did see some newborn royalty and had pledged their allegiance? I will admit the truth. I was threatened by this baby. If he was the Messiah, my days as king of the Jews were numbered. My reign was based on force. But if one who came had the power to sway the people's affections, I would soon be forced for my throne. I don't know for sure, mind you, that anything significant had happened in Bethlehem, but I couldn't take any chances. I had to destroy him. I had to use my power while I still had it, and let it work for me. I had to protect myself. I know, it looks like a heinous crime, the slaughter of innocence. The church has called it. Yes, I suppose, but it has no worse than the kings in other countries did at that time. Politics wasn't for weak stomachs in those days. I only did what I had to do. Harold the Great, a pretty sour wine he must have made, to be sure. But I was threatened, and fear makes you do strange things. Does it? I'm asking you. Do you ever feel threatened? You probably should. That's why I wanted to speak with you this morning. I wanted to warn you. You see, in the realm where I come from, where we are sentenced to see the truth, it's too late to love the truth. I see the truth about the baby who escaped my murderous plots. He was a king. A king in a way that I could never be. <laughs> king of the universe. The eternal Lord. And I was right about one thing. He was a threatening child. 
Make no mistake about it. You too are also threatened by that child. You have your own realms of power in which you like to exert your own lordship. You have those realms. You don't want to give them up. But what are to do when this child comes? But you and the Lord Jesus can't be both Lord at the same time. We try to make do by being sentimental about his coming. Oh, look at the little baby. How cute. How cuddly. Then later on you'll look to the cross and oh, the love. He died for me. We try to cover up with those little sentimental pageants choir singing, and of course, Harold the Greats. But Christmas has a very dangerous message. A new king has been born. And you must do one of two things. What are you going to do with him? Are you going to worship him? Truly worship him as Lord and give your allegiance to him and quit the charade you're living or continue to live a lie and be forced to deal with consequences. I have to deal with my consequences. Are you willing to deal with yours? I'm sentenced to the truth for all eternity. You too will one day find yourself linked with that very same truth. Will it be a truth you have loved or a truth you have lost in being self-centered? Will it be a truth that has saved you or a truth that has condemned you? I, I guess that's pretty much all I have to say. And I want to thank you for your time and hearing with me this morning. Herod has made a very valid point. He was threatened by this infant. Are we? We see the salvation of mankind. We sing joy to the world. New hope. But sometimes when we're looking at that major scene, we see our hopes in that infant. What we want, what we desire. That's not what he came to bring. He came to bring his hope to us. A far greater. But that means we must die to us. Kill our own King Herod daily. And pay homage to the one true king who died. Are you ready to give up your crown? and lay it before the King of Kings. If you do now, we'll be doing it for all of eternity. Because we read in Revelation, when Christ ascends to the throne, all who have received the crown of righteousness, or any other types of ground from heaven, will be laying their crowns at the feet of Jesus. But that is only if you realize who he is and accept him on his terms. You can't just love the baby and not accept his lordship. The baby comes with a title. Realize what it is and what it means to you or should mean to you. Then adore him as only you can. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we can come together. 
Yes, Herod did not do the best thing. But he does present a message. A message of making sure we have the right view. We like to have things done our way. No ifs, ands, or buts about it because we are human. We want to watch out for ourselves, making sure that our way is done. But that will only lead to death and destruction. Help us to see Christmas and see a greater glory if we bow before the manger and truly give our lives over to you. Not just with oohs and the ahs and the how cute, but say, Lord, you are king of our hearts. Be king of our lives from here and now the more. Amen. Shall we stand and sing?